All right, folks. Sorry for the delayed start. We had to confirm that we had a quorum, but we do. So the meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. Welcome, everybody. If you've not already done so, please uh, be sure to check in with your, your Seaboard ID, or if you're having trouble with that, check in with uh, Morgan out there at the table. Uh, thank you for your indulgence in those little pieces of paper I handed out. One of the main uh, responses we got from the last working group was people wanted to be broken up and not sit with the people they usually sit with, so we sort of randomized seating assignments here in order to, uh, to try to mess with that. But thank you for that. Uh, for our colleagues connecting at a distance, uh, please begin responses with uh, Potomac State or WU Tech. Uh, Potomac State, how many are present today? Sir, Potomac State has two present today. Thank you, sir. And at WVU Tech, how many are present today? WVU Tech has three senators present. Thank you, ma'am. And again, we have a quorum for today. So the minutes of the uh, February 11th faculty meeting, uh, faculty senate meeting have been distributed uh, as an annex to your agenda. Are there any additions or correction to the meeting, uh, to the minutes from the February meeting? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as written. Okay. And without further ado, I will ask President Gordon Gee to come up and give presidential remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize if I uh, sound a little uh, awkward. I have just been to a dentist. You know how that is, and they kept shooting me, I, uh, whatever. It's uh, kind of like... Um, well, I, I think it's kind of symbolic of what I've been through the last short period of time. How does that sound? So anyway, um, I, let, let's talk about campus carry. How does that sound, huh? Um, let, me, let me just kind of give you a little background on all of this if I can and uh, hopefully take any questions that any of you may have and, and, hope, and, and be of help in the best way that I can. So. Um, this is an issue that has been sweeping across this country for the last uh, four or five years, actually for a longer period than that. Uh, um, and uh, when I was president of the Ohio State University, we, we dealt with it by keeping it bottled up in committee. So the reality is this with the campus carry bill at the moment is the fact that if it ever gets under the floor of a House or a Senate, it passes because of the fact that uh, uh, everyone will tell you we'll, we will not pass it, or we will not vote for it. We, you know, if it were done in private session in the legislature, no, uh, we would win on each occasion. Um, so that's the reason we've always worked very hard to keep it uh, in committee. In the last three years, we were very successful. Uh, for four years in Ohio, I was, uh, we were very successful as an institution. So, um, the legislature every two years changes, and so we have about uh, we have about 30 to 40 new legislators. And so each year, every two years, we have to count the votes and see where the votes are and how we are going to um, be able to successfully defeat this. Um, so this year we made a decision because the votes were not there. In fact, the votes were exactly what we said. We, we figured it was 60 to 40, it was 49 to four, 59 to 41. We, we counted our votes very carefully, and that's in, the, that's in the House. And so I knew with a two-thirds majority that what we had to, had to do is we had to, uh, to um, work on, on, on a two-scale process, and we have explained this. We've done this several times in this uh, in here, and we've had these campus uh, conversations, which is that we will continue to um, to make the case to the legislature, which we've always done, which is that 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 that, that any of these kinds of bills ought to be uh, based upon local control. And as you know, we have been. Uh, We've been working very hard to gain much more freedom from the legislature, which we've been successful at. And secondly of all, um, with the governance restructuring we're going through with the Higher Education Policy Commission, et cetera, it's always easier to say that we, that we believe that we have, uh, that we have uh, a, a good board of trustees, that they are appointed by the governor, that they are confirmed by the Senate, that these kind of policy issues should remain at the local level, period. And uh, that's a much easier argument than just to say we're against something. And so that, is always, that has always been uh, our position. 
Um, so someone asked me, uh, someone asked me coming in, well, uh, why aren't you opposed to it? I've been opposed to it my whole life. I don't own a gun, never shot a damn thing, never will. I don't think that anyone should have. But you know, I'm also a devout Mormon. I don't believe anyone should drink alcohol. But they do. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, so my, so my personal beliefs sometimes can't be reflected in what is happening. So that is precisely what we did. And we have, we have, we have drawn that, we have drawn that, uh, that line. So we worked on a parallel process. That didn't mean to say that we weren't, that we were not, uh, not working on it. I'm not certain if, if, you know, this is just the reality. Uh, many of our faculty, I, I, I always ask, you know, what are you doing this summer? Well, I'm going to X, Y, and Z, and I'm doing everything. You know what I do every summer? I visit all 55 counties and all legislators. I know their families' names. I know their daughters' names. I call them up because I, ha I, I understand that in, in order to be successful, that we have to have that kind of a personal relationship. Because you need to understand, someone said, well, you know, the, the uh, Again, someone said, well, you know, the teachers went down. Yeah, the teachers go down. Public education is number one priority in, the, in any one state. And they can shut down the whole state. Then it's roads and sewers, uh, sewers after that, and then it's higher education. We come in third. Um, the other thing is, is the fact that this is the reality. Um, when I became president of this university in 1990, 90% of the people in this state and in this country um, had a very positive impression of higher education. It's now below 50%. So we just have to understand we are not in a powerful position, so we have to be very skillful about what we are doing. Um, and that's exactly what I think we have done. Now, I've got some good news, which is the fact that the uh, Judiciary Committee and the Senate uh, pulled the bill today. We, they don't have the votes. So maybe we've killed it again, but it's like Lazarus. It keeps coming. Uh, at least it keeps, keeps coming. It keeps coming up, and you know we thought we had it in the house, and and uh, and a uh, number of, number of my colleagues here in this room were celebrating and saying, I said no, uh, we, we've got to, we've got to deal with it, but we worked hard on it. We work hard on it. We continue to work hard on it. So I don't I don't want anyone here to say, well, you know, why? And, uh, someone sent me on. They said, well, the le the legislators will tell you that if you speak out on this and say absolutely not, they will not vote for it. Well. Nonsense. They, they tell that to you because they don't want you to come and sit on their office floor. That's what, that's what they don't want. Um, and, uh, and then the President Marshall speaks out, well, that's because no one cares about Marshall. <laughs> and I don't say that negatively. I say that, that you know, we represent, we represent uh, our budget is $4.5 billion and theirs is $250 million. We carry a lot of clout. But we also carry a lot of responsibility. So I say to our faculty, very simply, that we're working hard on this. We've been very, uh, we've been very methodical about it. We've been very uh, uh, passionate about it. No one is more passionate about it than I am. But at the end of the day, if this thing is to pass, and we had not worked on these exemptions, these exemptions are very distinct, and they keep us from having a raw bill. Because in, in Texas and Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, they just passed a bill which says they don't even have to have a background check. And it, uh, the 11 states have this, and 15, 20, 25 are going to have it by the end of the year. And most of them are going to have raw bills. We were smart enough to figure out what they did wrong in Texas, what they did wrong in Oklahoma, what they did wrong in Kansas, what they did wrong in Georgia, and we got those put into the bill. So, so at the end of the day, do I think that we're going to be a less safe campus? We've got 18 months to work this out if this bill passes. Secondly of all, I actually believe that we can work it so that there's no one going to be uh, threatened in any way, shape, or form. By the way, I will say this, and, and, and this is the reality. Uh, on these campuses where there has been a campus carry bill, there has not been one incident. People will say there's been an incident, but it was not, it was not related to this particular issue. There's not been one incident. So we have to have the reality of where we're dealing versus the, the concern that we have. And, and I think that that's important. So it's, uh, it's in the legislature. Uh, this is the last week. It was pulled from the committee. Maybe, uh, you know, let's hope that we've got, it, uh, we've got it off because if it gets on the floor, it will pass. If we can keep it off the floor, it will not pass. And, uh, and as I say that, and I'll also give you reality. If we had a plebiscite on this campus and everyone could vote 
in a secret ballot, more than likely this bill would pass. I just want you to understand that. This is a divided campus. People don't speak up. They're, they're intimidated. We should have free an open discussion about this. There are a certain number, of, uh, but, but if this bill were on this campus and it were a uh, plebiscite, I think it would pass. Maybe not overwhelmingly, but, re but I, was, I, I heard someone the other day say, well, you know, uh, they, they ask, well, what faculty are against this? Well, the faculty all raised their hand. The truth of the matter is we have faculty, staff, and students. We have 33,000 students, we have, uh, have 20,000 staff, and uh, we have about, about five or 6,000 faculty. When uh, we're a university community, and by the way, the most vulnerable people are our staff in any kind of an issue, because they're the ones who are on the line on a daily basis. And our police cho chief, chief told me that the most vulnerable, uh, vulnerable person at the university is me. And I don't say that uh, bravely, I, uh, it is just true. I'm out there, I'm the one who's visible, um, and, uh, and they always want to have me not drive myself, they want to have me do a variety of other things. I refuse to do that, I'm not gonna live with fear. And I don't want any of you to live with fear either. So, saying that, I'm open to any questions you may have. Yes, sir. My name is Peter Schaefer. I'm in the Davis College of Agriculture, et cetera. I have a question that's actually more a request. If the bill passes, which is a possibility, could we ask maybe campus police to provide some guidelines about appropriate reactions uh, when we staff, student or faculty, feel threatened? I mean, for example, if I'm teaching in the classroom, and I see a student with a gun, uh, and I feel threatened for some reason by that. What is my responsibility and what are my rights? Can I say, I'm sorry, I'm uncomfortable and leave the classroom? Or, I mean, I'm not sure. What would be the appropriate response? So we have some guidelines well, uh, uh, in know, case that, we pass. Uh, I have a great question, and we have 18 months. We have 15 months to work that out. And I think that that's what's important. We, this, uh, with the exemptions that we have right now. Now, I will tell you what my fear is. If we're able to block this, my fear is that it'll come back with a vengeance la next year with no exceptions, with nothing, and plus uh, we'll, our, we'll be punished with our budget. We were, uh, you know, when, when Jerry Gilbert spoke up, uh, spoke out uh, uh, the other day, uh, the, the House Judiciary Committee met and they reduced our budget by $14 million. Thank you very much. Um, I was on my knees, uh, I was on my knees to the governor and finally we got that uh, restored. But you know, there is retribution that occurs in these kinds of things, so we just need to understand that. But we do have 18 months, uh, I, th I think it's 15 months, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is, so, so that's good. Yes, sir. Um, uh, the point of order, uh, Jim Hunter's not a senator, so I'd like to recognize him. Oh, well, Jim, I, I know you, you're welcome, okay, get here. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the takeaways uh, at the med school last week with the campus discussion, um, it, was, it was clear that among the faculty, it was overwhelming support in not having that bill pass. But what was also clear, and, and the reasons were expressed, and I was one of the ones that expressed my reasons, including recruitment of faculty and recruitment of students. I think it would be more difficult. I don't want to go into all that now. I want to point out a couple other things. There was a student who got up and was in favor of it. And that student basically said, I got on the PRT, and I, I, didn't, I have a concealed permit, but I was not allowed to have it. And, I, and someone got on that was either on drugs or drunk or whatever, and was concerning to him, let's say. And he said, I wish I would have had this, or something to that effect, the ability to have a concealed weapon at that point. Of course, my thought is, well, if you did, what would you have done? And again, that's something that worries me, is those volatile situations that you're much more likely to have violence occur. Now, you're stating a statistic that zero occurrences, but at any rate, I think that we have to be concerned about that. Now, in t there was another uh, student that expressed, well, I guess a legislator expressed a concern that her daughter 
would not be safe walking from campus to her car, or something to that effect. And I'm getting to a point here. And, and then um, the opposition seemed mainly to come from the staff in the room. And one of the staff members said, I don't feel safe necessarily at night. What if someone comes in with an AK-47? So I guess uh, I was told uh, by Rob, I guess, uh, I had mentioned, well, maybe we should consider a compromise where we have a place, safe boxes or lock boxes, where either students or faculty can have access, but not in campus buildings, but in some place where there's access to this type of, if, 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 say, a staff member feels unsafe at night in the hospital, let's say, you know, um, then perhaps we can have some other alternative that might be a compromise where we don't have them in the classrooms, we don't have them on campus, but maybe there's a place that a student that has to walk at night home could put, put their concealed weapon and pick it up and then walk to their car or something in the med center where you could have a locked gun in a, and only certain people could get it, of course. Um, I've heard this doesn't work, but I don't fully understand why that might not be a compromise to, uh, in terms of some of the concerns that I've heard expressed of why people want to carry concerned weapons. I certainly do not, and I, don't, I would not want to be in front of a classroom where I didn't know whether students had it or not, particularly in a volatile situation like disputing the grade. But, but at any rate, is there any comment on the possibility of having some yeah, compromise? First of all, I think that's a great idea. So I have a daughter, identical twins. Um, her father-in-law carries a gun. So she bought a lockbox. When he comes to visit them at their home, she makes him put it in there. And she says, I just feel a lot better. I don't want to have those guns around my six-year-old. And it seems to me that those are the kinds of things. You know, I mean, I'm trying to be very clever, actually. I thought about uh, having a child care center in every building. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, with the exemptions we've got, we've got, we've got a lot of room to run here. And that, that's the point. But Jim, I think that's a great idea. I, I don't know what, uh, what, uh, what the logistics of that would be. But again, what I'm saying to you is the fact that this is not an either or. This is not the Texas, Oklahoma uh, cowboy system. We've got enough exemptions in here that we can really work through a way to make us feel safe and, 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 and work with our police and others to make this happen. But I want to be on, I want to be on the record that I'm not sitting here defending even the exemptions. I'm just saying that that was the political reality of where we were. We ran a parallel process and, um, you know, I'm hopeful that, uh, I'm hope, fingers crossed, if it doesn't, if it doesn't come out of committee, it doesn't pass, then we have another year to try to work through to gain, to gain support. I'm very fearful. Uh, with what is sweeping across this land, that this thing will gain even more momentum. So we just have to understand that we're, we're playing a very delicate game here. But I like your idea, I really do. And I appreciate the fact you'd come today. You had other things to do, Jim. Uh, yeah, Rob was the one who mentioned to me that he didn't think that would work, so I, I don't know well, the reasons. I, I but think but I, I think that you don't have to have a lockbox system in each building. You could have it perhaps a certain area that's well, key to we, we can have them all put them in Stuart Hall then I'll feel there you perfectly go. safe how does that <laughs> sound so questions I'm really open to any questions I want to make certain that everyone feels comfortable about having a discussion any other questions saying yeah there you go so <clears throat> Actually, just a point of clarification. So my name is Ann Morris. I'm one of the faculty in radiation oncology in the College of Medicine. And tell me your name again. Ann Morris, radiation oncology, Great. College Thank of Medicine. You, I'm sorry. No worries. And I'm married to one of the faculty members in anthropology who was very involved in the, the effort last week and down in Charleston. And there seemed to be a disconnect um, in the information because last week when I said, hey, we sent this letter from Faculty Senate, we all you know, agreed in opposition, this was sent on, and then the information that was coming back to me through my spouse from the delegates was no, they never got anything formal from the university, they didn't get our letter. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could speak on that and 
I clarify think, uh, that situation. Uh, uh, David, I think we sent a letter, didn't we? Yeah, we did send a letter. You know, again, let, let, let me explain to you. This is the reality um, that we deal with. They don't read their mail. <laughs> a lot of you don't read my letters either. I want you to know that, and I'm really offended. But anyway, uh, anyway, they, they don't read. And then, and then this is the other thing. This is the bait and switch. Oh, gee, you know, um, the university is really in favor of this, or they haven't come out strongly. You know, that, that, that's simply political conversation. That's because they don't want to, they, 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 they don't want to stand up and say yes, I'm for it or not for it. So I, I think I think you've sent another I think you've sent another letter down, and and when we've sent you know I sent down my letter again and uh, and but but I was on the telephone all weekend long uh, saying because. Uh, you, you know, the minute we hear someone say, well, you know, we don't, we're not qu quite certain what the university's position is, then I call them. One senator I have been calling for two days, he won't return my telephone call. Um, you know, it, some, people, some people just don't want to hear what we're really saying, and so I think that that's important. But, but we did send a letter, but, but hopefully some of them, now that it's kind of front and center, they'll ho hopefully read it a little bit more. That's my hope. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Ramana Reddy, and uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, to become a U.S. citizen, I had to read the Constitution. And I read the Second Amendment, and know, I know what it says. It says that uh, you can carry guns in order to enable maintaining a functioning militia. And militias are banned now, as far as I know. So these legislators who are pushing these things, I wonder if they've actually read the Second Amendment they have been talking about. If they did and understand it, they wouldn't be doing all this nonsense. Well, I mean, I've got my friend Maybe Bob Bastos. Bob, where are you? Stand right there. Bob and I are both constitutional lawyers. This is an issue that uh, has been debated. Uh, you know, when I was, when I clerked for the Chief Justice of the United States, this is an issue that they, that they talk about, you know, how do they, how do they, uh, how do they uh, interpret this? Well, the truth of the matter is, is I think that on the way to the Second Amendment, not many of them have read the first. And uh, so I think that that, I think that that's one of the issues we have to deal with. But that 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 is a that is a constitutional issue that will be determined by the courts. And what's your what's your guess, Bob? This is like this is like moot court or a law school <laughs> class here. <clears throat> well, the Supreme Court best has constitutional lawyer in the state, right there. I'm not a lawyer, but I know how to read. <laughs> Well, the Second Amendment's very ambiguous, but the Supreme Court has spoken and quite clearly that it does protect the individual right to bear arms, so, and has applied it to the states as well. Well, yeah. that may be so, but if... It may uh, be wrong, but that's what they've done. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. you know, I, 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 guess, I guess the point... If something that, is allowed to enable something, that thing that you're trying to enable is no longer legal, how can you justify it? the thing that you are saying you should have. I, I feel like That's I'm in a Supreme Court argument right now. Uh, <laughs> will the well, council please respond? Thank you. They, they have held that it's not limited simply to supply and militia, that uh, historically and as a matter of practice over the years, it has acquired an individual right to bear arms. And you can debate them, but that's all you can do right yeah, now. Why yeah. restrict to handguns? Why not lead so, guns, machine guns, and all yeah. those things? Well, we uh, haven't gotten there yet. The, the, this is an issue. So, so, so let me just say that you know, um, I don't think, even though I don't own a gun, gun, and I, I have no intent on doing so. A number of people here, I don't think that this this is not about the right to bear arms. This is about local control and campus responsibility and that's the way that I look at it. I think that I think if we argue the right to uh, bear arms as our fundamental as our fundamental um, reason for not wanting to have this we lose on that one. We lose in the in the court of law and we lose in the court of public opinion. And we're trying to win in the court of public opinion and that's the reason we have made that very clear distinction. We believe that our faculty, our staff and our students and our board of governors are the best to make that kind of a decision, and so that's what we're doing. Any other questions? Yes, sir. 
my name is Victor Mussino from Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And my question is about the, how we're going to measure the difference that passing this bill is going to make. And more specifically, um, when a bill like this takes place, is because in the minds of some people, there's a problem that needs to be addressed. And presumably, this is a solution to a problem that is going to be addressed. First of all, I don't know how bad the problem is. I don't know what is the problem that we're trying to solve by passing this bill. But if it's a problem, I'm sure that that problem is going to be corrected by this bill. The question is, how is this going to be measured? How, how are we going to see the difference between the before and after the bill is passed? You know, you know, this is a symbolic issue. I mean, if we really, if we really gave ourselves true serum, this is a symbolic issue. Uh, we can talk about fear and a variety of other things, but but there's a lot of symbolism to this. And um, the way that so the argument is this, and I don't need to go over the argument. The argument for not having it on campus is the very one that I've made, which is that we are better able to control ourselves. We don't we don't believe that faculty, staff, and students ought to be carrying uh, guns around, period. But, but that, is, that is gone because, because right now people can carry guns and, and, and conceal them and do a variety of other things. The argument on the other side, and I, and I just had a note sent to me today uh, from, a, from a student. He said two words, Virginia Tech. Two words. And, that, and, and the word is, is the fact that uh, the, that terrible shooting that took place there's a strong belief, and in fact, there was there was a uh, there was a uh, commission that came out and said if if there had been better response by the police, if someone would have had uh, had a gun or been able to do that, then all those people would not have been killed. So you see, there are there are arguments on both sides. We cannot be arrogant enough to believe that we have rectitude on this issue. We believe that it's better for our institution. Um, to, to control our own destiny in this regard. But there are arguments that do exist and that are legitimate. And to delegitimatize de uh, those arguments make us very vulnerable in terms of our ability to be able to carry on the business of the university with our constituents out there. Remember, we belong to 1.8 million West Virginians. We don't belong to each other, we belong to them, and we have a responsibility to each one of those people. So I think that I, I, David, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm going to, I'm going to be here right to the very end. And uh, and I welcome this. Now let me just say one thing about those faculty who've been very active. I appreciate it. I appreciate their, I appreciate the passion. I appreciate the uh, willingness to get out in the cold. I appreciate the willingness to go down and talk with legislators. I appreciate it. And I applaud it, and I think that that is what I say, uh, because I, I have some people say, well, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. Well, uh, as I point out, uh, you know, the First Amendment uh, will be valued and appreciated and protected on this campus enough, uh, no matter the cause. So everyone have a great day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, President Key. Okay, uh, the Provost uh, McConnell can't be here today, uh, but we have John Campbell from the Provost Office. Do you have anything formal you want to say, or? Uh, no, but I'll take any questions if you have questions from the Provost Office. Okay. So, uh, given that, uh, that, that campus carry is clearly something that is of concerning to folks, I do know of at least one senator uh, who wants to make a, a resolution here or ask the Senate for something. So I'm gonna ask for unanimous consent to change the agenda, to move new business to this point in the agenda so we can finish all the campus carry stuff and then move on to the regular part of the rest of the agenda that we need to get through. I, so. Can I ask a question? Of sure. Ms. Dr. Campbell? Um, so before we move on to the change of the business or the change of the agenda, I'm Amy Hessel. I'm from Geology and Geography and the Everly College of Arts and Science. I've been one of the faculty members down in Charleston last week. I spent two days down there. Um, many of my colleagues have been down there. We have had an amazing experience. We've learned a lot about how our state government works. Um, and it's, it's been remarkable right now. Um, 
there are dozens of WVU students in the office of the Judiciary Committee where they're meeting, so it's no surprise that they tabled that issue. That doesn't mean that it's off the agenda entirely, it's just off the agenda for the next couple hours. It will probably be brought up again this evening or tomorrow, so this is by no means over. Um, I would like to say that over the last week, we've seen the bill nearly killed um, and then resurrected back to life. And now we see this, it's being tabled, so I really believe that the pressure that we're putting on the legislators is really, really working. So to that end, we've organized a event in Charleston on Wednesday that we are attempting to communicate to faculty. But as it turns out, faculty don't have the ability, or even senators don't have the ability to post on the faculty listserv. So I would like to ask if the provost would allow a message to be communicated over the faculty listserv that communicates this event happening on Wednesday in Charleston. So that's a question for the provost's office. So, uh, I mean, David and I discussed this uh, earlier today. If, if the faculty senate chooses to want a message to go out all faculty, we're happy to facilitate that. That's great. So then I think that leads us to a change in the agenda. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna ask for unanimous consent to change the agenda. Is there any objection to moving to new business next? Okay, then I believe we have to have a vote. All right, we need a two thirds vote in order to change the agenda. So all those in favor of changing the agenda to move to new business next, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Okay. So we will change the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, can I get the votes from Potomac State, please? All three of us vote yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And can I get the votes from W Tech? We all vote yes. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so then we're going to move to new business next. Does anyone have new business to propose? I do. So um, I have distributed this letter that has been distributed to at least 82 faculty senate executive officers from higher education, public institutions of higher education across the state. It's been um, signed by many faculty from many different institutions. So um, I would like to request that the text of the letter, uh, we don't need the signatories, but the text of the letter be distributed um, to the faculty listserv of the university. So I propose a motion that we request that the provost distribute the text of the letter to the faculty listserv. Okay. Uh, discussion or second? Second first. Is there a second? There, a second? there is a second. All right, is there any discussion? Would anyone like to speak to this? Uh, Nick Bowman, Everly College. Just one point, um, removing the signatories, of course, makes sense, but then it probably doesn't want to come from the provost per se, so does it need to have some claimant for, like, who wrote the letter? Just if so we don't miss a small detail on a clock like this, that's all. Right, so, I mean, we could keep the signatories on there, or we could sign it ourselves. So uh, I sent a letter out to the Senate last weekend, you may remember, right? So I would be happy to provide a roughly similar block at the top that says, at the request of a senator, without endorsing what's in the letter, Senate has asked for this to be sent to all faculty as a point of information so that faculty being, can be kept abreast of you know, events on campus or something like that. Sure. Well, so, so the motion is that uh, faculty senate will request of the provost's office that they send this letter, uh, which was distributed to you, uh, which essentially is an organizational letter uh, for uh, faculty and students and staff to go down to Charleston uh, to express their concern to the legislature on Wednesday morning. Uh, and they would have act, uh, it's, it's an organizational process uh, to do that. Uh, again, the letter would go out not from the Senate, but it would be noted that a senator wanted to speak to the faculty uh, and the Senate was facilitating that communication. Can I ask a 
ask a logistical question about what would happen if people choose to go down for both students and faculty that would be missing classes. I guess that's I've got no, so I, personally, I got no idea. I mean, I think that there's an awful lot of latitude in general uh, for certainly faculty and students uh, to take time off uh, from classes and other things. Uh, that's sort of part of the nature of, of being a faculty member and certainly part of the nature of being a student. Uh, and uh, as, as for uh, staff ability to take time off, my understanding is the provost has actually communicated to the staff and said that uh, supervisors should work appropriately with staff to allow them where possible to do that. I, I, don't, I think there are some staff where it would not be possible given their jobs and the nature of what they're responsible for. But my understanding is that the supervisors are, are being instructed to have discretion, appropriate discretion, to let staff take time off and participate in this. So just kind of a point of order here. Um, you, Dave, or Amy, you actually have the ability to send to the faculty listserv, but it's a moderated list. So um, I think it may be more appropriate for either one of you to send it and ask the provost's permission to have them approve it and distribute it, because the alternative is it would be a message coming from the provost's office to everyone. So I guess in terms of like, you know, it would be from, and it could either be from Dave or from Amy or whoever, but I think that'd be a little more appropriate than having it come from the provost's office. I agree completely, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm more than happy to have it come from me and note that it's from a senator and I, I am facilitating the communication from a senator to the faculty. And it, this does not represent the position of the Senate, it does not represent the position of the provost, it's a communication. Yeah, it's simply for information. Yep. Does anyone else want to speak to this? Any comments from Potomac State? No comments from us, sir. Thank you. Any comments from W Tech? No comments, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then having a motion and a second, uh, we will now proceed to a vote. All those in favor of a communication from a faculty senator being sent out to, through the Senate to the faculty, uh, with a header that sort of says this is for information purposes and doesn't represent any actual change in position in any way, shape, or form, please raise your hand. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, then it is passed and I will get together with you, Amy, and we'll sort out the logistics on this and try to get it out. Is there any other new business? Okay, then we will rejoin the agenda already in progress. Okay, um, so a couple of points for my remarks, and then we'll move into uh, the, uh, the, the, the curriculum committee and other things that, which need to get done today. Uh, I had a faculty member point out to me that there were some issues, I think I've talked about this before, with eCampus. eCampus was closing down uh, before students were able to get all the information from it uh, and appeal their grades if they felt it was inappropriate. Uh, we've gone and talked to eCampus. They are willing, the eCampus folks are willing to keep eCampus open uh, until the time when students would, the, the end of their grade appeal time uh, would expire. However, that sort of turned over another rock, which is that the university policy says that you have 10 class days to appeal any grade you get from the university. No one knows what a class day is. So does that include summer? Does that include winter? Is that just the normal spring and fall terms? In any event, as soon as we get some clarification on exactly how much time students have to appeal grades, we will make that change and then we will also uh, keep eCampus open so students will have access to all the information on eCampus up until the point of uh, uh, their being able to appeal grades. I'll, in, that will probably go into effect for the fall 19 semester, so we have some time to work that one out. Uh, I want to thank everyone, senators and other members of the faculty assembly who have voted for the incoming class uh, of senators. That ballot is still ongoing, so I would remind you and to, say, to tell your constituents, please vote uh, for the next class of senators so that we can uh, have them come in here and continue to do the work of the Senate. Uh, additionally, there was a survey that went out to senators asking them for their preferences on serving on Senate committees. That has closed. However, if anyone feels a great urge uh, to, to, to uh, participate in that, if you want to get some information to me, I can try to get it to the committee on committees. Again, I would point out that the vast majority of work of the Senate happens in the committees, and that's where a lot of the interesting, useful stuff happens, and I would encourage all of you to serve on committees as well. 
Uh, again, uh, a new position announcement for the faculty ombuds position has been opened by the provost office. This is open to any faculty member and is a 25% FTE commitment. The position announcement and all detailed information is at the listing at careers.wvu.edu. We haven't had an ombuds uh, person for some time and I think it's an important position that helps sort of faculty manage their relationship with the university uh, and so I'd certainly encourage you to talk about this with your other colleagues. Uh, it only benefits us if we have a good person in this position. So I would ask for you to think about who you think would be good, approach them, and try to get them to apply to this. Uh, again, it's only, uh, it's only good for us if we can find the right person to do this as well. Uh, last uh, comment for me, uh, we're exploring moving the Senate to the law school next year, so ending our time here at the Alumni Center. We're still working out the scheduling and technical details to do that. I'll report back officially whether it's happening one way or the other, but just FYI, we may be ending our time here at the Alumni Center moving to the law school. They charge us a fair amount to be here, so if we go the other place, that either frees up some money for more and better food, or I can embezzle it and try to run away with it one of the two. Um, okay, that's it for my remarks. Does anyone have any questions for me? Okay, next up on the agenda, announcement of declared candidates and nominations from the floor for faculty senate chair elect. This is the final point at which people can nominate either themselves or others to be faculty senate chair elect for the 1920 academic year and then we move on to be faculty senate chair for the 2021 academic year. This is a non-board of governors election year. So whoever is elected will only serve as faculty senate chair, not on the board of governors for West Virginia University. A person elected next year will do that. So here's your final chance to nominate someone or yourself to be faculty senate chair. I will note the candidate that has already been declared Claire, Natalie St. Corcoran has uh, been nominated and accepted a nomination to be faculty senate chair elect next year. Uh, I would like to call for additional nominations from the floor. Are there any additional nominations, either self-nominated or if you would like to nominate somebody else? Okay, I will check with the satellite campuses, Potomac State. Any nominations or suggested nominations down there? No, sir. Okay, thank you. WVU Tech, any nominations or suggestions? No, thank you. Okay. All right, then last call. Going once, going twice. Okay, nominations are closed. Uh, the, the candidate will have an opportunity to speak before the Senate in the April meeting and submit a candidate statement beforehand, and I believe we have a vote at that time as well. Okay. Next up, Ed, Curriculum Committee Report and moving stuff for the Fall 19 academic year. Good afternoon. I have for approval Annex 1, 2, and 3. Annex 1, uh, a set of new courses. Annex 2, some changes and deletions. And uh, Annex 3, Capstone Courses Report. Also for approval, changes to the Environmental Geosciences Program, uh, to the major in Biomedical Engineering, and the change from an AOE to a major in uh, German studies, Chinese studies, French and Spanish, and change to the major in interior design. Okay, we're going to put all of these together into one votable item. However, does anyone have any questions or points of discussion for annexes one through three and all the changes to the various majors? I'm Amy Welsh from the Davis College, and I just had a question for Chem 111, um, some clarification. A lot of our majors take that, and we are, with the shift in math from 124 to 126, several faculty noted that 126 is a prerequisite, whereas we are in the 124 framework. I don't know if that is something that would be new business for the committee, but it was a concern of ours in terms of the prerequisites for Chem 111. Dave, how do you suggest to address that? So, to the best of my knowledge, how this works is when a, when a uh, program suggests changes to a course, they're supposed to check with all of the various other programs that use that course as a prerequisite in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I, so, uh, not on curriculum committee, do we know if, if chemistry checked out there? I'm looking at you, Lou. Okay. 
So then my suggestion is we're going to pull Chem 111 from the agenda. I don't think the change was to Chem 111, was it? It's to the 124, 126? Oh, it's the math change that has yeah, an effect on chemistry? That has that but is a prereq change to Chem 111. I knew there were also some, some yeah. Chem and bio changes. All right. So then we will pull Math 124 and 126 from the agenda. Go back. Just. So they shouldn't have been on this agenda in any event. Oh, they're not on the agenda? Okay. Then are you asking that chem be pulled so that we can sort this out? Yeah, I was asking that chem to be pulled because that would be for chem 111. Yes. Okay, so then I would suggest we move forward with the agenda as it stands, pulling Chem 111, but we will quickly talk to chemistry in hopes of catching this up to make changes in the fall, because again, we would like to, I mean, there's good things behind this. So we will try to sort this out relatively quickly. ASAP. ASAP, and then we may have to have an electronic vote or do something to sort of push this through Senate if it, need, if it can't wait until April. Okay, are there any other, hopefully less confusing, points of discussions or questions for the agenda, for the votable items. Okay then, so I would ask for those in favor of approving the modified annexes one through three and the new programs, please say aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, so then we will pass all those along and then sort out CHEM 111 relatively quickly. Uh, a couple more for information items, Ed? Yeah, two items for information, a new minor in general business and uh, in Appalachian studies. All right, these are non-votable items. So are there any questions or points of discussion for the new minors? Hearing none, those new minors are filed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is a General Education Foundation Committee report from Robert Brock. I have Three, yep, three, one for approval. Uh, Annex four, which is approving two actions we're making, or someone, biology, I guess, is changing, well, you can read it. <laughs> Bio is, is decoupling their lab courses. Decoupling their normal and courses the with their lab courses. courses. To be GEF eligible. Yes. Okay, so one votable item. Are there any questions or points of discussion for Annex four? No, I skipped over them. So should I go back or keep moving? Just go back. Okay. So then all those in favor of approving Annex 4, uh, please say aye. Those opposed? Since I failed to go to the regionals for the last one, they get to vote twice this time. So Potomac State, how do you vote on the previous set of curriculum committee changes? Two eyes on the previous and two eyes on the current. Thank you for being efficient. I appreciate that. Uh, and WU Tech, how do you vote on the previous set of curriculum committee changes? WVU Tech has four eyes on the previous and four eyes on the current. Okay. Thank you. And again, I apologize for missing over you folks. We had to deal with the confusion there for a second. Okay. So we have two information items from yes, GEF two, committee. Two for information items, Annex 5 and Annex 6, which are just the transitions the GEF transition from GEC and uh, Human Foundations course. Okay, uh, that's Honors Foundation. Uh, oh, and honors, sorry. Yep, no problem. Human. So are there any questions or points of discussion for the GEF transition review or the Honors Foundation courses? All right, hearing none, then those courses are filed. Next up, a report from the Teaching and Assessment Committee from Ashley Martucci.
Hi, currently we are doing some investigative work on restructuring the language for the SEIs, some instructions for students, and then the email that goes out. We are also working on some course section review um, for CDFS and engineering. That's continuing um, throughout the semester. And you hope to have reports on both of those, I think, before the end of the year. We definitely hope so. <laughs> cool. Okay, next up, uh, Committee on Committees, Membership and Constituency Report. There's just a brief Standing Committee membership change. This is Annex 7. Are there any uh, questions or points of discussion for Annex 7? Okay, all those in favor of approving Annex 7, please say aye. Those opposed, say no. Potomac State, how do you vote? Two ayes, sir. Okay, WU Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech has four ayes. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, next up, for approval, resolution to establish the Faculty Senate Inclusion and Diversity Committee. Uh, as I discussed at the last Senate meeting, I'm asking permission to form a new Inclusion and Diversity Committee. This will be a standing committee. The committee would be focused on faculty-related issues in and around diversity, uh, campus climate, inclusion, access, retention, other issues. There are lots of bodies at WVU uh, that look at these sorts of issues, but none that come from a purely faculty perspective uh, and look at issues from a faculty point of view. That seems important, I think. So, does anyone have any questions or comments about the proposed committee? at this time. Okay. Uh, if not, then uh, I need to ask for a... I need a motion to establish the Faculty Senate Inclusion and Diversity Committee as outlined in Annex 8. Do I have a second? Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. Okay. Potomac State, how do you vote? Two eyes. Thank you, sir. WVU Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech has four eyes. Thank you, ma'am. The eyes have it. The committee established, and I will work with the Committee on Committees to populate the new committee for next year. Thank you much, Lee. Uh, next up, report from Faculty Representative to State Government, Roy. Roy Nutter, Statler College, and your ACF rep. Uh, ACF is been almost totally consumed with campus carry. Uh, all the noise is about campus carry. The, uh, and you're as up on that as anybody else as of today. The um, only other bill that's probably causing some consternation is Senate Bill 1, which is um, sometimes called, a, I guess, the community college bill, but it's now affecting a number of the four-year schools. Uh, a last dollar, last dollar in kind of bill for students who want to go to a higher education. Uh, that's currently stuck in the House Finance. I don't see it moving. I don't know what's going on, but welcome to the legislature. Uh, other bills, I printed these out in case you cared, but a number of bills have made the crossover. The House has about 15 pages, and the Senate's, Senate bills that went over at about 10 pages. So they've got a lot of things on their plate. Remember the session's over this week. If you really want to have some fun, you can watch it on TV on Saturday night. They go to midnight. I know you really want to do that. Uh, have you heard anything about either budget or at one point there was discussion of salary increases and whether that would affect higher education there or not? There's a Senate bill and there's a House bill and they do not agree. So if they get it done by Saturday night, they'll be done. I have my doubts. If not, they usually go to special session, which will occur next week. Okay. Anyone have any questions for Roy? Okay, next up then would be a Board of Governors report from Stan Heilman. All right, the board has not met since the last Senate meeting, but uh, just a few details about one of the rules, which is Board of Governors Rule 1.4. That's the ethics conflict of interest and outside con consulting rule that we've talked about quite a bit here. It is in effect as of March 1st, so that it is now current. Uh, one important note is that uh, each college and school or unit uh, will determine their own workflow in terms of the approval form con from consulting. That means whether it's approved at the dean level, associate dean, department chair, or some of their 
uh, designees. It kind of may depend upon how your department or your school is set up. And then a final point of that um, is that that rule applies even if you're a nine-month uh, faculty appointee and that consultation occurs during your appointment off time. Um, so that's it, Dave. Okay. Any questions for Stan? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, so if you'll indulge me, I'm going to do another working group session like we did in December. Uh, I'm gonna talk through a little bit here and give you some idea of what this is and then we'll get to it relatively quickly here. So I've worked with uh, Lou Slimak out of the provost's office to put to the, together the ideas here. Uh, as I talked about last Senate session, this is a working group exercise so the faculty can have input on the metrics and data collected to populate the metrics for departmental and programmatic success and trouble. Part of the program review is to evaluate all programs for their viability, which is pretty clearly a nebulous concept that includes alignment with institution mission, departmental, uh, department's facilities and equipment, its faculty composition, its producti uh, productivity, however that is measured, the program student enrollment and success, however you measure that, uh, how the program assesses itself and the learning within the program and how it plans for improvement. WVU uh, would like to have a more transparent, rigorous, data-informed method of reviewing those departments and programs that could be under scrutiny for problems with some of those metrics. The goal of this group here uh, is to be able to identify early what programs are struggling so that those programs are given due consideration, including potential additional resources, support, administrative help, or whatever before some decision is made. I thought it was important for the faculty to have a voice in the metrics that are used to determine program success and failure. In other words, which metrics might be trending or helping to determine uh, the department's trending towards trouble or trending in the other direction as well. Uh, as such, this working group involves asking faculty to help identify those measures that they would like to see included in the review process, particularly in areas of faculty productivity and student success. So, we're going to give every table a pair of scenarios, first one and work through it, and then the other. These depict fictitious departments, and they really genuinely are fictitious. Uh, uh, so once we've chewed through the first one, we'll move on to the second one. These scenarios contain some basic information about the departments that could serve as criteria for evaluation. We'll also hand out a sheet of sort of questions for the groups at the tables to sort of work through. Uh, that sort of uh, let you think about how you're going to evaluate the department, but most importantly, what sort of additional information you'd like to see in order to effectively and accurately evaluate the department, the fictitious department. So beyond making a judgment on the scenario itself, what we'd really like to know is what is relevant to the discussion, what criteria and information is missing, and generally what data we should be collecting and looking at and what we shouldn't be collecting and looking at when trying to look at and decide about and think about these departments. So overall, the goal here is to, one, provide some transparency uh, for the faculty to see the criteria and understand how the criteria operate, and two, let faculty through the Senate comment on the criteria so that they can be, the criteria can be modified, fixed, expanded, contracted, whatever, so that they're most effective in helping departments see what's going on. So here's how it's gonna work. We handed out the scenario sheets and the review worksheets to every table. Each table should have a discussion for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so of the four questions and collectively come up with some answers for each of the questions as a group. Uh, one of the comments we got back at the last working group was you really wanted to have sort of a group part of this. You didn't want it to end and go away. So next up, once you've sort of worked through that and have some answers on the sheet, we're going to project up on the screen uh, a website uh, where every faculty member can put some comments in about what they would like to have seen in terms of additional criteria or additional metrics and other things like that. And we can create sort of a word cloud around that so that people can see what most folks are fastening on or not. Uh, and then after you sort of put that in, uh, put in some, some comments or, or skipped over that part, you can vote for one of the five criteria that the Board of Governors use. It's listed on the bottom of the worksheet that we handed out as well. And that vote also will be electronically and we can project that up on the screen and you can see what people vote for collectively in the room. And again, then we can sort of discuss that a little bit. Then we're going to start, so before you vote, 
here's the goal here, right? Before you vote, we have some additional pieces of information we did not put on the scenario sheets. And so the goal is before you actually vote on one of the five outcomes, as you listen to the additional pieces of information, then you can hopefully get enough to vote on. And we'll, that will help us understand things, right? As, you, as we put up the information and talk about it, and you feel like you can make a decision, go ahead and vote. And we'll see in real time, as people get the information, what is finally enough for them to make a decision versus what not, or something like that. And then at the end, we'll have a vote, and we can talk a bit about that if people feel like saying, well, you know, most people voted for this, and I don't understand why, or something like that. We're going to sort of a conversation about that. And then if we have time, we'll move on to the second scenario or something like that. But so that's the, the goal here is to collectively by table talk about these things, come up with some answers to those questions, and then as I said, we'll put something up and so everyone can individually participate in putting some comments in and then voting on things. And again, all of this serves to let us collect some information uh, about metrics, about what we should be measuring, what we shouldn't be measuring, what we should know and what we shouldn't know about departments and things like that. So that's what we're doing. So I'll give you 10 or so, maybe minutes. We'll sort of walk around and sort of take a poll for the room and see how people are doing. Please talk amongst yourselves. And once we've sort of done with that stage, we'll move on to the visual part here and let you do that stuff. All right, get started.
So we're going to need at least one person at every table to write down some answers so we can collect the sheet of paper. If more than one wants to, we'll take all the pieces of paper you're willing to give us, but we do need at least some answer from every table for the sheet.
All right, so while you're finishing up, if you see up here on the screens, if you have a smart device with you of some kind, if you want to go to the www.menti.com and punch in that six-digit code, it will give you access to a little box or something, and you can write in, as I said here, what additional information do you need before you can recommend an outcome. And you'll note on the lower corner here, it gives a little uh, lower right-hand corner, there's a zero, and as people start to punch in, that number should go up, and this should hopefully create a word cloud uh, of, of what you guys are putting in. And then we can move to the next screen, which actually shows what the votes are, but don't vote yet, so put in whatever words you wanna put in. Don't vote yet, because as I said, we're gonna start reading you some additional information about this scenario. And then you can vote, and if you think you have enough information right now, feel free to vote. If you want to wait to hear what additional information, that also helps us figure things out. So again, the point is we're going to give you additional information and see how and when that triggers people to be interested and willing to vote. All right, the word cloud is now illegible, so <laughs> we're going to attempt to move on to the next one here. Well, it, it turns out you can put more than one in, so we have 40 people who have entered something on the order of 80 different words. All right, so now, before you vote, Lou Slimax is going to come up here and read you some additional pieces of information about the program. Feel free to vote at any time, but the point is we're going to kind of keep an eye on what piece of information. <laughs> there we go. 
feel free to keep an eye. So that's what tells us something, right? We're going to see what pieces of information trigger more people to vote in the way that they want to vote, right? So here we go. Yeah, you're welcome to vote now if you want to before I start reading. All right. First piece of information. Both regional and national growth over the past five years has declined about 1.5%. A sizable decrease is usually measured in half percents. I'm going to pause the beat between each piece of information so I can actually count. Future projections for both regional and national demand are down also about 1.5%. About two-thirds of all program graduates enter law school. About half of those attend WVU Law. Department courses have low use by other departments. None are required in any other program, and several are offered in the GEF but have low usage. Hello. Hello. Last piece of information then is their program has no dedicated classroom or lab space or specialty equipment and no then deferred maintenance costs or maintenance fees. It's a cheap program. That is it. That's the last piece you got. Roughly stable, Dave. What are you hoping it's not? I'm waiting for it to roughly stabilize, then I'll step away. You can either do this one, do you want to do the next one? It was fairly quick. I'll see if anyone wants to talk. Oh, that's a better idea. Yeah, we don't have to worry about I mean, we can do the next one another day. I'll see if anyone wants to talk, but if they want to, I mean, it's not that late, so I'm happy to do another okay. one if they're willing to. Just okay. I'll ask them. So 15, 48, 56. 40. Thanks. All right. Okay, so the majority of folks voted for continue, so develop, basically, uh, work to attach this or think about attaching this to another program. Does anyone feel the need to say anything about this? Would anyone like to comment about this scenario, about some additional piece of information that they really felt that they needed, that the, you desperately needed, or there was too much information, or there aren't enough possible outcomes, or anything else of that sort? Microphone. There was a lot of discussion at our table about sort of like what's the nature of this program? Like how fundamental is it to the university? And I'm not really sure what that means exactly. 
in this so, day and age. Do you mean fundamental in the context of how important it is to the state, how important to the university, how important it is to something like arts and sciences? I mean, I, I think it critical or trendy. Um, I think what we're actually getting at is like historically, how long has it been part of a university? Is that fair? Is it a relatively new kind of program I think, versus like, something that's been around? Yeah, for flash in the pan versus something that has existed in universities for hundreds of years kind of thing. We had a real similar discussion about just context, that it's probably the case that it's not appropriate to evaluate a department on its own merits, that that might be how it's approached and how it would make sense if you're in charge of slicing up the pie. But as we've talked about interdisciplinary studies for decades now, and as we've worked really hard to mesh programs into each other, there are situations where removing one program by itself there's too many connections in there. There's too many cross-listed courses, there's too many majors and minors, there's too many dual enrollments, that there might need to be some discussion, whether it's historical, whether it's like the concept of a loss leader. You know, if you don't have this program with 15 majors, you lose prestige because you don't offer something that is expected of a university. So it could be at the historic level, it could be contemporary, and admittedly, I don't think we really formed like what this would be, but there was a notion of like a network that, that you really can't just take a pie out and look at it by itself, and that there may need to be some way of coming up with a metric or a criterion or some explication as the context. And, and some sort of metric that really looks at interdisciplinary is the wrong thing, sort of connections to other Possibly. programs. In other words, so yeah. some sort of to what degree is this program intertwined either yeah. academically, in a research sense, in a teaching sense, with other programs via students or research or something. Yeah, I can think of two sh very short examples, programs with more minors and majors, for example, which don't count the same way from like credit generating dollars and things like that. So you may not have the right numbers. You, you think about the shift to MDS and then a lot of departments lost students, but really didn't because they're still in class, they're still serving. But if that program were to be dissolved, you lose all those faculty, and then suddenly there is a major shift. Yeah. So that's one example of this idea of being networked. Okay, that's so. good. Anyone else? So uh, our group also talked about a couple of other things, um, data for resources as well as for students. So since we don't have anything going back, we don't know if they used to have five tenure track faculty who have now left. And so then maybe we can explain some of the recruitment and retention apparent issues. Um, but also looking at what are the national trends, right? Is this just one year falling off? Uh, and as CB pointed out, if there are 22 students in uh, some of these that sort of would seem to belie what Lou said, that they're not being used for Jeff, that they're not being used by other units. If they've only got um, between 11 and, and 13, sorry, how many majors, 12 majors, uh, then who, who are the other people taking those classes? Just random, are they taking it because it's an easy A? Presumably not, or there might be more people in them, right? I mean, there's, there's just a lot more information. And to Amy's point, whether it's mission critical or trendy, you know, that, that can also speak to, is this a result of a nationwide trend that we see happening, for instance, English departments, philosophy, w foreign languages, uh, you know, falling off in the last 10 years, or is this a, a brand new major that we just really don't have any depth of data to compare it with? So, uh, I mean, a lot of good stuff in there, but also non-GEF, non-majors, why are they taking the course? Right? So wh who, who's not taking the course for any reason? Why are they in the course? Anybody else? An appropriate answer might have been none of the above. Sure. And the reason I say that is that one of the choices that I think should have been considered is to make it a program as opposed to a department. With a program, it's kind of an intermediate step. You can go either way, but it's not disruptive. And particularly if it's service courses that have broad spread and would affect a lot of departments, making a program would cost less, you have a director instead of having a department chair, changes the administrative structure, but it's sort of an interim step to you decide which way you really want to go. And that's not one of the options, so that would be something as well. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Are you willing to do another one of these or is it getting too late? Okay, so 
would you mind if we did this again then at the April meeting with the second department? Is that okay? All right. So thank you for doing this. I hope this was somewhat interesting. Uh, we're at the end. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Thank you all, and I will see you next month. <laughs>